Welcome to this video on an introduction to Time Resolve Microwave Connectivity, or TRMC. So this video is basically meant to give a very brief introduction to the, uh, the basic operating principles, and we're going to go into more depth in future videos. So the acronym TRMC stands for Time Resolve Microwave Connectivity, and it's an experimental technique we use to determine the conductivity of samples. So we could have a material, for example, uh, and we don't know uh, the charge carry mobility or the photoconductance of the material, and it's something we want to know for various reasons. Um, and with time resolve, the TR component, the acronym, is due to the fact that we measure this conductance, um, or this conductivity, as a function of time. And the M is for microwaves, as microwaves are the probe, and the way we actually uh, evaluate the conductance, or the conductivity. So, First of all, before we describe the technique, let's quickly explain why uh, we'd want to use TRMC. So I've already said that TRMC is used to evaluate the conductance of a material. And technically, it's used to evaluate the photoconductance, the changing conductance um, upon an application of light. We'll come to that later. Um, but why could you not just do this via conventional methods? Well, you can. Um, you could take your material, whatever it happens to be, let's say it's this blue material here, um, attach some electrodes, which in this case are gold, um, and then all we do is um, we have an experimental setup, we put it in place, and then we connect some conducting needles to these uh, to these electrodes, and then essentially apply voltage and see how much current flows. So a very simple um, measurement. In reality, you'd probably do this with uh, something called a semiconductor parameter analyzer rather than a battery and a multimeter, but the principle is the same. Um, so you could, for example, put these electrodes onto a thin film or a crystal or whatever it happens to be uh, to experimentally determine the uh, the conductance or the electrical properties generally. Uh, and this is yeah, by far the most common way in which the electrical properties of materials are evaluated. There are a couple of potential problems which can come up with this technique sometimes. For example, you do need your film to be continuous. So for example, if you have something which is more reminiscent of the image on the right, where you have these gaps, uh, and holes in your thin film, because for whatever reason you found it difficult to deposit a continuous layer, uh, it may make it challenging to evaluate the electrical properties this way, because you need a percolating network between the two electrodes for current to flow. You know, typically what happens is a synthetic chemist will make some materials and they'll end up being in some sort of powder form. So this image on the left here is showing an example of this. A synthetic chemist has made a variety of different compounds and this chemist wants to understand their electrical properties. The question is then, how do you go from powders to something which is reminiscent of a device? And this is actually often a non-trivial problem. It takes a great deal of optimization um, to get this right. Okay, but let's say that you can form a continuous film and you are able to put electrodes down onto your material. Um, even in this case, the electrodes are going to complicate the situation um, beyond the scope of this uh, video. But what we find from basic semiconductor device physics is that when you take a metal and a semiconductor, and in general we're going to be talking about semiconductors, uh, and you put them together, the properties, the energetic properties, change significantly from when they're separate to when they're together. So what we have here is just a very simple diagram where on the y-axis we have the energy um, and the dotted line at the top there is meant to represent the vacuum energy and the x-axis is meant to represent some spatial dimension. And what we find is that as the metal and the semiconductor get close together or come into contact, charge will be transferred between the two of them and this will cause the bands to bend and the electronic properties to be altered from their initial states. In addition to that, we also get into facial effects where we find that the bonding properties at the edge of a semiconductor in three-dimensional space are not the same as the interior. So if you take silicon, for example, it's covalently bonded to the four adjacent silicon atoms. At some point, when you get to the edge, it's going to have to terminate, and these silicons are not going to be bonded to four silicons. And you know, The properties of that interface are going to be very, very different from the properties of the interior to the semiconductor. So we have a significant interfacial effect as well. This makes it challenging to interpret the electronic properties, the material itself, um, when you have to also optimise um, the contacts and the interfaces. 
So the major reason we use time resolved microwave conductivity is that it's a contactless technique, i.e. we can measure conductance, like I say, it's technically photo-induced conductance, um, without making electrical contacts. So we don't need, need any contacts. Um, we don't even need a continuous film. In fact, you could do these measurements on powders or fluids in addition to uh, continuous films or crystals. And this is why we need microwaves. You can think of the experiment to be a little bit like placing metal into a microwave oven. Though it's a little bit more complicated than that. So how does the technique work? So for now, let's consider the most basic description of time resolved microwave connectivity. In the next video, we'll talk about it in a little bit more depth and how you'd actually go about carrying out these measurements in reality. So we're just going to describe our system as having some sort of circuitry which is capable of producing um, an oscillating electrical signal and also detecting one. And we're not going to worry about the details of how that happens uh, quite yet. So what this is, this is just a signal generator, essentially, but it's operating at quite a high frequency. Typically, um, in the laboratory at Oregon State University, it's around 8 to 9 gigahertz. It varies depending on the exact, uh, the exact system. So this electrical signal, which is in the microwave frequency regime, uh, is sent down a cable and into an antenna, which is inside of a cavity. Um, and essentially, you can think of the cavity as just being a metallic box. But first of all, let's think about the antenna. So what's happening is we've got this electrical signal uh, being fed into the antenna, and the signal is in the gigahertz regime, low gigahertz. So what this means is basically we have electrons traveling one direction and then every approximately one ten billionth of a second they change direction and go back the other way. And what happens is if you have electrons moving backwards and forwards like this they will emit electromagnetic radiation and that's exactly what they do. So this is why we use an antenna. It's because we want to take our oscillating electrical signal and convert it into actual electromagnetic radiation, i.e. microwaves. So the electromagnetic waves are emitted from the antenna and then they pass through a small iris, which is just basically a circular aperture, uh, and into the main portion of the cavity. Um, so the cavity is made out of metal, typically copper or something like that, uh, and to the microwaves, its uh, metal is reflective. So one good way of thinking about TRMC is to, to think about it in terms of light. You can imagine, because light is essentially the same thing, just a different frequency. Um, you can imagine that you have light being passed into the, through this iris and then it's inside this cavity. And if all of the sides are reflecting, you can think of them as being mirrors for, for the light analogy, uh, you can imagine the light bounces backwards and forwards. And that's exactly what happens. You get light traveling forwards, it's reflected off one end and then comes back and is reflected again. And if you choose the cavity dimensions correctly and you choose the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation correctly, you can form standing waves. And that's how we design the cavity in a time resolved microwave connectivity system. It's generally to have one full wavelength of the electromagnetic wave. And we choose microwaves because that happens to be on a macroscopic scale, a few centimeters um, support a electromagnetic wave around eight to nine gigahertz. Of course, in reality, these walls are never gonna be 100% reflecting. So you're always gonna get some loss but because microwaves are being continuously supplied, you are able to form this, uh, this standing wave. And the system is designed in such a way that it's not only able to just emit microwaves, it's also capable of detecting the reflected intensity. So because these um, walls are not perfect, there's always gonna be some reflected intensity coming back out through the iris into the antenna uh, and into the microwave circuit. So what happens is you choose the correct frequency to get these standing waves, you form a resonance in the cavity, and the reflected intensity of the microwaves is being detected. So if you were to measure the intensity as a function of time, you'd basically see a flat line under these conditions. And this is the equation for a standing wave, where we have E is the electric field strength, this E0 is the magnitude of the electric field, and then we see it varies as a function of both time and um, position. So we have the first time here, this cos omega t. Uh, omega is the frequency of the microwaves, and t is time. And then sine kx, where x is the position in the cavity and k is the wave number. Now we put in the sample we want to measure. 
We position the sample one quarter of the distance along the cavity, either one quarter the distance from the front or one quarter the distance from the back. We do this because we want the sample to be held at the maximum of the electric field. So by placing the sample at one of the maxima of the electric field, we remove the spatial dependence and we're left with this slightly simpler equation. So this is a technique primarily used to measure the properties of semiconductors. So these are materials which at room temperature in the dark have a very low concentration of electrons and holes. Any electrons or holes which do exist in the semiconductor will move under the influence of the electric field where the velocity of charge carriers is proportional to the electric field strength and the proportionality constant is the charge carrier mobility. So because we have this oscillating electric field, the charges are going to be moving in one direction for every half cycle and then moving back the other direction. And what this means is that any charge carriers which are in the sample will be absorbing energy from the electric field and hence the reflected microwaves back to the detection circuit will be slightly changed when there are carriers in the sample. So what we do, we take our sample, which should have a reasonably low concentration of electrons and holes in the dark. We illuminate it, create these electrons and holes. They move under the influence of this standing electric field. And then the microwaves that are reflected back to the detection circuit are changed. If we have knowledge of the properties of the cavity and the detector and a few other things, we're able to take this change in detected microwave intensity and convert it into a sample conductance. And that's basically the principle of the measurement. As the title suggests, the technique is time resolved. So typically the way a measurement is carried out is that you continuously measure the conductance as a function of time. Typically electrons and holes are created with a pulse laser. So let's assume that the energy of the incoming photons is greater than the band gap of the semiconductor. And this means that carriers will be able to be generated via band-to-band -band transitions. When the pulse of light hits the sample, we'll see this increase in conductance. Then when the pulse terminates, uh, carriers recombine and we get a reduction in conductance. So a time-resolved microwave conductivity experiment encapsulates quite a lot of information. The height of the signal on the y-axis gives you the conductance. And for a particular laser fluence, you can convert that into a proxy for the carrier mobility. So basically, the larger the signal, uh, the larger the carrier mobility of your uh, charge carriers. It's basically how fast they move in your sample, normalized for electric field. Then we also get this decay as well, which tells you a lot about the recombination mechanics of how electrons and holes recombine. So thanks so much for watching, and next time we'll be talking about how to conduct a TRMC measurement in reality.